Welcome to The Thriving Christian Artist, the podcast where we help you connect with God to bust through the roadblocks that have held you back for years, create the work you love, and really live the life you know God created you to live as an artist in His kingdom. I'm Matt Tama, your host. Let's get started. Well, hey, everybody, it's Matt Tommy, and thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I'm really excited to have my brand new friend, Pat Butinsky, who is here. Pat, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I'm so glad. Listen, you're one of those people that uh, I, I, as I'm looking at Facebook, I'm always excited to see your work come up because I think you're doing such incredible work with really beautiful depth and there's so much to it. And I'm every time you show these Facebook videos, I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. Look at what she's doing. So, (laughs) so I'm so excited to hear more about your process today and really share that with others, because I I know that there's got to be a huge story um, behind what you do. So tell me, you know, we met through the created to thrive artist mentoring program. um, But tell me, you know, even way before that, How did you even get started in doing what you're doing? How how long have you been an artist, been painting, and and just all of that? It is, you know, definitely a beauty for Ash's story. Wow. Um, I I, I was always an artist. I don't ever remember not just sort of doing that. You know, I love Goodwill Hunting, and he asks him, how do you learn? And how do you know all these things when he's talking to Minnie Driver in the restaurant? Do you know that scene? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, I don't know, I could always just play. Wow. And that's kind of the way it was. My mom was an artist, um, so it was never squelched. It was natural. Um, But um, so everybody knew it, including the person in the house that was my abuser. Wow. And um, yes. And um, my, it's all, you know, not like your story, but there's been reconciliation. Mm. Uh, I led my father to Christ. Wow. I took care of him when he, with his stroke and God just, you know, buttoned that up so beautifully. And now my mother's a believer too, but I was not raised in a, in a um, religious home. We believed in God. You know, I always prayed. I always knew there was God. I I always knew he was with me, Um, but I just didn't know about the whole gospel personally. yeah yeah sure so um one of the things that my father would do and and one of the main things i remembered after i got saved and was saying why god why um was uh he offered to buy me crayons mm. and i was like yeah and he said come on i'm gonna take you down to drug fair to buy you some crayons and um so i went and uh, when I first started to tell my story, I kind of, that was in my 40s. I didn't get saved until I was 44 years old. Wow. I'm 53 now. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I'm young in the Lord. and I That's right. Again. That's I right. really did, you know, like revert uh, <laughs> for the first time. I became a child. Wow. And that's what drives everything. But the poem was something like this. He said he'd buy me crayons, but he didn't. Instead, he drove out of the tracks, over the tracks. Hey, aren't we going to get crayons? Silence. He pulled into a desolate field. As she whimpered and cried, he split her identity in two. Mm. No one to hear, no one to help. Hey, how's about those crayons? She covered her parts and said, no. But he bought them anyway. And she hid in the box. Wow. Wow. And, but what God showed me was the very thing that the devil used to buy my silence became my voice. Praise God. Praise God. It's been my voice my whole life. It's where he kept me, He kept me sane, you know? Isn't that the truth? There's the thing that the enemy wants to use the most to kill us and to destroy us. God wants to use as our voice and our greatest point of reconciliation and healing in others. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So talk about that, that box. I mean, you said I, I hid in a box. What did that box look like for you? And did, 
were you creating at that point? Were you, you know, involved in the creative process at all? And Yes. You know, I mean, as a child, I would draw a lot. I would go through pads and pads of paper. So mm. um, my mom was a working mother. She was in advertising, um, sold advertising. And so all they had to do was give me newsprint. I had two older brothers and I would just draw all the time. And uh, when I was in first grade, I always came home sick. And uh, my mom would come and have to leave work and come and get me. And uh, she'd say, you better not be drawing up there. <laughs> and she'd run up the stairs real quick and I'd throw it down the side of the bed. <laughs> not me, not me. I'm not doing it. <laughs> no, and then she'd pull the bed out and go, oh, oh. There it is. <laughs> My bed. So, um, yeah, I always, I always expressed that way. And I, I could do pads and pads of um, stories mm. almost. Mm. And uh, that would keep me very occupied. Wow. Or, you know, if I, you know, my mom wanted me to clean my room or something, she'd say, you're not coming out of your room until it's clean. Well, I could do that all day long. Wow. I'd clean out my bookcase and start making doll houses and draw. So I just always had a very rich uh, imagination and inner life. Yeah. Now and, talk uh, about a little bit, you know, as you become an adult and the Lord begins to bring you, you know, into walking through healing uh, in your own life from a life of abuse and, you know, all that sort of thing and all, and all the baggage, obviously, that that, that brings with it. Um, had you left your art? Had art continued to be uh, a big part of your life? And I'm, I'm interested in how your art now plays a part in your spiritual process, because I think one of the things that I love about your work um, is that it's so it seems on the surface so chaotic and yet there's so much balance and beauty in it. And then there's this very real um, visceral sort of uh, mark making in the work that um, I don't know, it, there's just something really life giving about it. And so I'm just interested to, to hear how your own art process has, has happened in your process of healing. Again, it became my real life support system because I wanted, you know, I, I, I left home uh, a couple of uh, months before my graduation. I moved in with my brother and um, and I just had to do odd jobs and there really wasn't any money for school um, until um, an aunt of mine that I went to saw a watercolor painting that I had done. And so she fronted me money to go to community college. Wow. I didn't know what I was even going to go for. <laughs> it just was, you see, I've always been narrowed down to that one thing. Sure. That one thing. So if you would say, how did I pursue art? I would say art pursued me mm. every step of the way. Mm. And so um, I went to Middlesex County College and I saw something called marketing art and design. And I said, well, that I'll take that. <laughs> That sounds like me, I, right? <laughs> that's art in it. I had traveled out to California and hitchhiked around and everything, but that's a side story. Uh, it's another rabbit hole. But anyhow, um, so I took that. And the first day that I got there, I just knew I was home. Wow. I loved it. So I did graphic design, and art direction, and then had my own business for 14 years, um, you know, as a art director, creative director, and then my own business. So I started to really put words with pictures, you know, very early on. Um, and you know about that because you say you have a graphic design background. So right. I, I can never really separate the two. Sure. Um, so that's really where I got the foundation for, I believe, the underlying design pinnings that you see mm. under the chaos that's on top. Yeah. Um, I used to be do very minimal. I had to leave my business when my son developed an anxiety disorder and I became a stay at home mom when all the moms were going back to work. So, you know, after I got everything in order, um, I just started to paint a little bit because I had a box of paints that my mom uh, had taken me to a, a watercolor class with her a high school class and at night and she wanted to do something with me. So I, she stocked me up and I just showed up and I took to it like a duck to water. You know, a lot of people think watercolor is so hard. Right. To me, it's normal. 
It's just so, what you started with. It's just what you knew, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, she was an oil painter, so she struggled. But it was, that's what I'm saying. Every step of the way, it was just kind of natural. And um, so uh, I had to leave the business after all that time. And, uh, you know, I still had all these ideas. Mm. So I just kind of pulled out the, uh, and I really was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, which did become a full-blown nervous breakdown. And um, so I kind of went back to that box mm. and I literally opened the wooden box of watercolors that were still intact, these great Windsor Newton watercolors. And I started to paint still lifes or the Friday flower special or what have you. Sure. And um, after about a year of that, I wanted to study because my kids did go back to school. And um, so there was a Ducre School of Art, which was nearby. And I went there after I had visited a, a gallery called Swain's nearby. And I had gone to the top floor and I saw this one artist's work. And I said, Lord, I didn't even know it was a prayer. How do you paint like that? It was it abstract was just, or was it realistic or? <laughs> no, it was it was um, very, um, she had a lot of brushwork. Um, it wasn't a lot of washes and things that I had learned traditionally, but it was very lively brushwork and it was very expressive. Mm. And um, so uh, I signed up for the class and I went in to pay and they said, well, look, you know, we want you to know that the teacher that's supposed to teach the class um, isn't going to be back this semester. And I said, I, I, I don't care. I, I just want to be here. Yeah. And so I said, well, by the way, you know, I turned on my heels and I said, uh, so who's teaching the class and they said Pat patricia brentano bromnick it was that painter wow <laughs> divine appointment right <laughs> lord how do you paint like that wow now you're paying attention right <laughs> now i'm jumping up and down and they're thinking okay here's crazy pat whoever this woman is and i'm going yay, yay! perfect perfect <laughs> Yeah. So I studied with her for a year and then she left and went to Keene and all the students turned to me and said, well, we don't want to disband. You teach the class. And I was like, ah, I don't know how to teach. I'm just learning how to paint. I'm just here for so the like, class. Yeah, right? They literally marched me into the Dean and being someone in advertising. And he said, well, can you have a, a synopsis on my class tomorrow? I want to say no, but I said, yes. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> I had never missed the deadline in 26 years. I'm not going to start now. Right? And I wanted to say no. So I did, and I hated it. Oh, I hated it because I just love painting. And now all these people became prima donnas, and they were running me ragged. You know, I was trying to make everybody happy. Uh, I knew nothing about teaching. Wow. So I kept, uh, that kept going, and I kept getting references to, uh, galleries who took me on and in my first year I had over 15 shows and I, I literally stopped stopped the machine and said I don't want to do this anymore mm. I, I'm, I'm teaching I'm working that's not the plan I need to be home for my son so I really put the brakes on it but I kept getting referrals for teaching so I would say about six years in it was like a Seinfeld show I would go in to an interview <laughs> I'd say I really don't want to be here, but somebody recommended me. So because they're my friend, I'm here. Right. Um, I really don't want to deal with prima donnas. I'm never, 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 never going to be a teacher who sometimes paints. I said, I'm a painter who sometimes teaches. Wow. I mean, how honoring is that? <laughs> like but but how want... wonderful because you're like, this is who I am, right? You're like, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> she gives me two jobs. <laughs> so I went out in the car and I called my husband. I said, I can't believe what just happened. I'm, I'm teaching at the New Jersey School of Visual Arts. It's a gorgeous <laughs> place. I mean, I, I kept upgrading. And then I got hired out of that. I had a, a class. They brought me back to teach a class for Carl Berger, who was a this and I just was going to babysit really for five weeks and he never came back so I started teaching that class and then I got a call from the Montclair Art Museum 
because somebody there had seen my work or whatever and wanted to know if I would come there if they could get the students. And I said, well, yeah, if you can put it together, I'll, I'll come. Yeah. So they hired me sight unseen, and I just met them the day I started the job up there. My goodness. And I stayed there for six, seven years. Wow. So are you nowadays primarily painting? Or are, you, are you still teaching a little bit? or? Well, what happened was a student of mine came down and she said, Pat, you need to look at this Instagram. And she said, just paint and post. Mm. Just paint and post. And I actually had not really forgotten how I paint. Because I was so invested in each one of my students and trying to get through to them whatever they needed and give whatever they needed that I would plan for a whole week just to teach for three hours wow. and not be paid for it. But I really wanted to see them break through. Sure. And so when I sat down to paint, I didn't know how I painted anymore. Mm. And so even that, all this craziness, um, I was always a minimalist and um, liked a lot of white space and all that. And... Um, but I got to the point where I couldn't paint big anymore because the veneers got bad. So I started to doodle in my lap and that started to sell on Instagram. Wow. Wow. Little by little by little, uh, somebody messaged me. I didn't even think you, I didn't even know you could sell on Instagram. And they said, do you sell your work? And I said, well, I, I guess. <laughs> and so she, a woman from uh, a photographer from California, bought my first piece and she sent me a check for half the amount. I sent it to her. She, so it was trust on both ends. And then another sale a few months later. And, uh, you know, I mean, you, you know, I have like 32,000 followers and it's totally been organic. Wow. I just painted and posted and paint. And I love the camaraderie with other artists. Sure. The, I, I just interacted a lot and it was, authentic and genuine. I wasn't really trying to create a persona or brand. That's incredible. Um, that, that's really my story. And I don't know if it's really helpful to anybody because I, I get lots of questions about how did you do it? And I said, well, first of all, I said, you know, what I can tell people is paint it until you love it. Mm. If you don't love it, you're not finished. You know, it, unless that's what you want to do, unless you want to make products. Right. But I knew that 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 wasn't what I was doing. I was always searching for sort of the holy grail of the next uh, interesting thing, whether it was color or line. And in this case, I didn't know anything about mark making. I mean, I knew about gestural abstraction and things like that, but I, I had always done that very large. So when I kind of got down and somebody gave me some paint markers, I was like, <laughs> it's on. <laughs> oh, let me see what these can do. Yeah, sure. And sure. literally that's how this style developed. Wow. Because it was easier to sort of put stuff in a backpack. And if I could get out, somebody could drop me off maybe at Starbucks just so I could be with humans. I would just bring my little pouch and my drawings and just keep, drawing and posting and drawing and posting. And then they became larger and larger paintings. People like you say paint larger, but you're not the first one. Wow. So then I ended up getting this Mamu easel. And my cousin last week sent me a picture with this giant canvas. And I'm going, I don't want that. I'm, what am I going to do with that? And then it was almost like I heard, you don't want that? And I said, do I? Do I? <laughs> And it was huge, just bigger than me. And she said, I'm going to bring it up for you. And I said, Lord, what are we doing? <laughs> and so now I'm painting bigger. <laughs> I love it. It's all by default. That's right. So I do go with the flow. That's right. That's right. Talk about your spiritual connection with your work, because I'm, I'm always, you know, interested in hearing for some artists, they feel this really visceral spiritual connection when they're when they're creating what it is they do for others it's sort of an undercurrent that runs that's there but it's not something that they're overtly thinking about you know as they're creating how does that work for you how does your relationship with the lord inform your work uh your process all of that uh, i would say it's very much integrated mm. uh when i first got saved i was glad that i didn't grow up in a church um, but when I first got saved, I, I really, I, I fell in love with Jesus. 
I fell in love with Jesus so much so it, it was such an intimate relationship that I didn't tell people at church I was saved. I didn't tell my husband I was saved. I just wanted it to be me and Jesus. Mm. So, uh, and then I was called, which is another rabbit hole to worship. And it was an open vision and it was in the middle of a um, service. And when I was called from the balcony, come to me, come to me. I said, why me? And I heard this voice say, somebody's got to go first. Mm. And I just got into the lobby, went into the thing, took my shoes off, didn't know anything about any of this, walked up and I just laid face down. And I said, okay, Lord, please don't let me be ashamed. You know, that's my biggest fear. Don't let me be ashamed. Don't let people think I'm crazy. And as I started to walk down the aisle, the pastor was preaching. He said, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Mm. come and so then I, I i was just laying down and i i felt these wings on my back these wings i, I didn't have you know i came out of a brethren church <laughs> and I we don't do wings, wings right <laughs> <laughs> i got baptized in the holy spirit and i wasn't allowed to tell anybody <laughs> so uh yeah so I, I, I said, well, I, I don't want to stand up. And, 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 and the voice of the Holy Spirit said, just stay on your knees and dance unto me. So I became a worshiper, heavy duty, like just caught up. So it, I was just always in dialogue with the Lord. And, um, you know, the, the art, everything that I do, I was always aware of a duality. And now it's very natural. I mean, he's my constant companion. Um, am I always aware that he's hovering or directing me? No, but um, I never feel lonely and I and I always feel his pleasure. I've always felt like God cares more that we create than what we create, that he's really, like you're saying, he wants us to be us. That It's like that beautiful quote from St. Irenaeus that says, the glory of God is man fully alive. That is, you know, the more that, I'm exactly who God called me to be and created me to be the more that God's glorified. And there's nothing more that I have to do. And I, how freeing is that for all of us as creatives that we don't have to do it right, or we don't have to create this or that, you know, to please God. So I love that. Right. You know, you have such a, a, a vast experience of teaching and making and walking through just an incredible healing story in your own life. Have there been or is there now in your life or as you look back on your journey, a habit or a couple of things that you say, man, ha doing this in my life has really borne a huge amount of fruit. Had I not done this, I don't know that I would be in the place that I am today. I think if I hadn't trusted the process, I mean, because, mm. you know, you know, good days, bad days, good years, bad years. Sure. You know, um, and not knowing the Lord, but just knowing that I wanted to live and I wanted to be good. And um, I wasn't sure how to do that. I did go through a serious perfectionism, which I think served a purpose because I always wanted to be a good girl, not a bad girl. Um, so I had to be the straight A student. I, I had to, you know, if, if, if I got a project at school, I would work all nighters and walk in half dead and I'd win every design show. And I really wasn't trying to compete with people. Uh, it was just something that was internal with me. If it wasn't good, then I was trash. So mm. that drove me. And that is the thing that, that kept driving me toward, I guess, excellence in a way. And then when I guess that served its purpose, that foundation was very much intact. But as I went through my healing journey, the performer went away. That's such a wonderful place to be. <laughs> I have courage. I had so much things, so many things to be afraid of that I lived through. And, uh, but all of those things serve to, you know, give me a barometer to, you know, well, how dangerous is this? You know, uh, you know, it's just pain. Just go for <laughs> it. Just 
you know. And I love to watch your process on Facebook because you do go for it. <laughs> I mean, you just get out there and go for it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I just love it. You know what I mean? I'm just like I love a kid. It. And I just go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it shows. It shows. The teaching helped me articulate yeah. that so it wasn't totally random. See, when I'm by myself, I'll just sure. go for it. When I'm teaching, I I had to learn how to articulate the process so that they could learn. But I never teach sure. people how to paint like me. I'm very much invested in teaching them how to paint and how to problem solve when I'm not around. Because yeah. I don't need followers. And I need to make painters that find their own voice right. and sing their own song. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. You know, this has been so fun today. As you look back on your journey and you you look back at the little girl that you described as your younger self and even as a young woman, what advice, what would you speak in to that younger version of yourself today? Because there are so many artists out there who will listen to this who are maybe in that same situation, maybe walking through some of the same difficulties that you walk through. What would you say to them uh, to, to con continue to give them encouragement on their journey. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, remember that it is a journey. Um, yeah. You're not going to solve this thing or button it up in one day or a year. It's, it's a process and you you have to give yourself permission and the same kind of grace that you would give another person or even a child who's learning to walk. And just, mm. if it pleases you and you feel, uh, don't do it because it looks like a cool thing, um, but if it looks like something that you just must do, then just start. Just try to remember how to play again. Mm, because I, children that's are good. such great artists. And we lose the ability to play, to imagine, to stay fascinated. Um, and I, I always say um, that I, what has really kept me growing is that, uh, and takes the pressure off of me, is that I'm fascinated and I'm focused on that more so than being fascinating to somebody else. Hmm. That's, that's a good word. Does that that's help? a good word. And what a, Oh, it helps that I know somebody out there right now is just saying, yes, I needed that. I needed that. Well, Pat, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful encouragement to me. And I know to so many others, and um, I just can't wait to get to know you more as the years go by. So thank you so much for being on today. I'll see you at gathering. Hey, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with me today on the podcast. Listen, I hope it's been a huge encouragement to you on your journey as an artist. Hey, also, before you leave, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the other episodes of the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. And also, be sure to connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, or at my website, which is matttommymentoring.com. Until next time, remember, you were created to thrive. Bye-bye.